In this first question up here, we're asked what the IUPAC name is for L-glyceraldehyde shown here. The correct answer is D. If you want to know why, stay tuned. Okay, in this question, we're asked to produce an IUPAC name for this molecule, L-glyceraldehyde. Now, of course, L-glyceraldehyde is a common name for this thing. How in the world do we produce an IUPAC name for it? Well, the best way that I can think of is to be able to convert it into a traditional sawtooth structure. This is, of course, a Fisher projection. Let me show you what I mean. When we see a Fisher projection, we have to remember that what it's actually showing is three-dimensionally all of the things that are here along the horizontal line are pointing up towards us. That is, they should be drawn as little wedgies. And then the things that are along the vertical axis are supposed to be pointing away from us, so they're kind of like little dashies. Well, that presents kind of a challenge when we have to convert that into a sawtooth projection. What I try to do is look along the carbon chain. I've got carbon 1 here, carbon 2 there, and carbon 3 there. And imagine what that looks like if I were to take this out of the board and lay it down sideways. If I were to lay it down sideways, I'd have my carbon 1 right there, I've got my carbon 2 up top, and then I've got my carbon 3 going down here. Carbon 3 is, of course, a CH2, and it's got an OH attached to it. This is carbon 3. Hopefully you can make that transition. If not, build a three-dimensional model using a model kit and look at it until you can. Now, we have to determine what in the world is going to be coming off of carbon 2 and in which direction is it going to be pointed. What I did is I grabbed this uh, aldehyde, this CHO, and I grabbed the CH2OH, and I pulled them out, and I turned them sideways, and laid them down onto the plane. So I've got a little wedgie coming out of the plane towards us, and then I've got a dashie going over here. Who goes on the end of the wedge? Who goes on the end of the dash? Well, what we're looking at as we're staring at this thing in a Fisher projection is I'm staring right down the crotch of carbon-2. Legs spread, pointing up towards me. You'll notice that the right leg has an H on it, the left leg has an OH. As I grab that thing three-dimensionally, pull it out, and then lay it down on the board, the H ends up being on the end of the wedge, and the OH ends up being on the end of the dash. Hopefully you can make that transition. If not, once again, build a model. So now we've got our structure drawn in a nice sawtooth projection. And once again, when I say sawtooth projection, I'm talking about the traditional carbons going up and down like this. They look like teeth or something, sawtooth. <sighs> How in the world do I convert that into a name? Well, I've got a couple of functional groups. You'll notice that I've got an OH, which is an alcohol. I've got another OH, which is another alcohol. And then I've got an aldehyde over here. Now keep in mind, when it says CHO, what that really is, is it's an abbreviation for this. That is an aldehyde. Which of these groups, alcohols or aldehyde, take highest priority when you're doing an IUPAC name? Remember, generally speaking, the more bonds you've got to oxygen on a carbon, the more oxidized it is, and hence, the higher in priority it becomes. So the carbon doubly bonded to the oxygen is the most oxidized state, which means it gets the priority. So the aldehyde will be the highest priority, so I will number in this direction that gives the aldehyde the lowest number, rather than numbering from carbon 1 to 3 uh, left to right. I'm doing right to left. Hopefully that makes sense. So, got my aldehyde. So, how in the world do I name an aldehyde? Well, I count the total number of carbons in the carbon chain. I've got three carbons, and normally a three-carbon long chain is propane. When I'm talking about an aldehyde, however, I erase the E, and I replace the E with an AL. So that is pronounced propanal, or propanal, if you're emphasizing the wrong syllable. What that means then is that off of carbon 2 and carbon 3, I've got two OHs dangling, and these OHs are not considered uh, priority functional groups in the parent chain name. They're considered substituents. What is an OH called when it's a substituent? Well, I know that an OH is called an alcohol if it's the priority group. So if I had an alcohol as the priority group, it would be propanol. But when it's a substituent, what do I name an OH? Oh yeah, I name it hydroxy. Okay, so I've got hydroxy coming off of carbon-3, and I've got a hydroxy coming off of carbon-2. So I'm just going to write down 2-hydroxy, and then I'm going to write down 3-hydroxy to kind of get sort of my lineup going. You'll notice, however, that one of these guys is a stereocenter, carbon-2. 
What does that mean? Well, what it means is that I have to determine what the configuration at that center is. Is it R or is it S? How in the world do I do that? Well, what I do is I prioritize all the groups around carbon-2. So I've got carbon-2. It's bonded to an oxygen, a hydrogen, a carbon, and a carbon. Who has the highest atomic number and hence the highest priority between those four groups? It's obviously an oxygen, so I'm going to write down number one right here. Hydrogen is, of course, always going to be the loser. And then I've got a carbon and a carbon. Who has a higher atomic number, carbon or carbon? Okay, they both tie. So I have to go out one more to break the tie. This carbon is bonded to an oxygen. This one is bonded or doubly bonded to an oxygen. Who has higher priority? The one doubly bonded to an oxygen, which means that this entire branch over here is considered priority group number two, while this one over here to the left is considered priority group number three. Now, when we're determining if a stereocenter is R or S, what we do is we trace a circle going from one to two to three, and if it's clockwise, that's the direction that I would turn my wheel if I were turning my car right, then it's R. If it's counterclockwise, it's the direction that I would turn if I were turning left, then it's S. I sometimes remember turning right is R and turning S or turning left is sleft for S, so R and S. However, in order to do that, I have to point my lowest priority group, group number four, three-dimensionally away from us. You'll notice that it is not drawn that way here. It's pointing towards us. So I have to imagine what it would look like if I were on the opposite side of this wall staring at it. One to two to three looks clockwise right now, but if I were on the opposite side of the wall so that group four were pointing three-dimensionally away from me, it would indeed be counterclockwise. And counterclockwise is turning left or sleft, which means that this is an S stereocenter. So this molecule is an S at uh, position two, so I'll go ahead and add that to my lineup. I've got two S right there. So now we combine all of these substituent elements together into one magical overarching substituent name and then tag propanol onto the end. So this is going to give us this final IUPAC name, 2S, and they'll, they sometimes put these in parentheses and then a little dash for some reason. And then we have 2 comma 3 dihydroxy, dihydroxy propanol. Or probe anal if you want to entertain your friends at parties. In the second question, we're asked what, uh, oh gosh, this question is stupid. We're asked what the IUPAC name is for the molecule that will be formed according to the reaction uh, described here, which is really, really crazy. The correct answer happens to be B. If you want to know why, stay tuned right now. All right, this question is slightly ridiculous because it involves a transformation that I can't. Imagine being able to do in at least one or two reaction steps. I think that it would certainly be possible to do in multiple steps, but it would be very, very convoluted and you'd get pretty crappy yields. Nevertheless, it tells us in this question that this molecule is subject to some reaction conditions that magically break this carbon-carbon double bond and replace it with a completely saturated hydrocarbon chain. When it says saturated, what that means is you have no carbon-carbon double or carbon-carbon triple bonds left anymore. It's just all single bonds. It also says in the question that the carbonyl, that is the carbon-oxygen double bond, is left unaffected. And then asks us to come up with an IUPAC name for the final product. So what that final product is, and this reaction I'm going to describe, I will call magic, because that's the only reaction condition I can think of that would do this. And at least a single step, converts this molecule into this molecule. So I've started with this molecule A and I've been given molecule B and I think that honestly half of the problem with this problem is determining what the product B even looks like. Okay, now that we've done that though, what in the world is the name of this final molecule? Well, in order to give that molecule a name, I have to first of all determine what the longest carbon chain is that contains the functional group. The highest priority functional group, and indeed the only real functional group in this, is the ketone, the carbon-oxygen double bond. So the longest carbon chain, as I'm looking at this, is going to be the one that goes through the ketone and then goes down in this direction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, alternatively, and I should point this out, we could number in the opposite direction. Which of those two directions is correct? Well, it's going to be the one that gives me the lower number at the carbon that is doubly bonded to the oxygen. So indeed, the first direction that I wrote down earlier is the correct one. So I've got a seven carbon long chain. Now normally, a boring old seven carbon long chain with nothing in it is called heptane. 
This, however, is not a boring old carbon chain. This is a boring old seven carbon long carbon chain that has a double bond and oxygen right in the middle. This is a ketone, which means, and I'll go ahead and write this, ketone. What that means is I take the E off and I replace it with the suffix own. And I also have to place the number three in front of it <clears throat> in order to indicate which of the carbons in that seven carbon long chain is doubly bonded to an oxygen. Now, by IUPAC standards, as far as I know, this is acceptable as a parent name in this case, as is this. You can also call it heptan 3 own I'm not certain which of these two varieties is the one that's going to appear. Now, all we have to do is determine what is a substituent. Now, keep in mind, this is my parent chain, the seven carbon long guy right here. Woohoo! With the carbon oxygen double bond dangling off of position three. Now, at carbon four, I've got a substituent dangling off of that. It is two carbons long. Count them. One, two. What is a two carbon long dangly? Well, once again, two carbon long chain is normally called ethane. When it's a substituent, however, I drop the ane and I add an ill. So it's an ethyl and it's positioned or attached to carbon four. So the final name of this guy is going to be four ethyl, three heptanone or four ethyl, Heptan 3 own. Either of those are completely acceptable and correct. Now for this third question, the correct answer is D. Now I'm not going to explain the answer here because I already did in my previous video. Plus it's kind of shown right here, so there you go.